Happy New Year to everyone on this first day of the new year, 2024. It's also the 87th day of the war of the Islamic Jihadi group Hamas against Israel and the Jewish people. And it's the time of year that we're seeing usually colder weather. It's a very beautiful sunny day, clear skies. And we're hearing war planes going overhead. We're still in this war, uh, this terrible war with its high costs that are taking place in the south of Israel where we live in Beersheba. So I'm the pastor of congregation Yeshua's Inheritance, Nachalat Yeshua, and I want to speak a little bit today, I hope not too much, on the fourth kingdom and beast that we read about in Daniel chapter 2, chapter 7, and through the rest of his book. We hear about or it's referred to by Yeshua, by Jesus, by Paul the Apostle, by John the Apostle in the Revelation. Just want to speak about it a little bit because I think it's something relevant to us living in these times. But this new year, everyone has to relate to it, 2024. Every receipt you receive, every check you might write, anyone who writes checks today, uh, the whole world has to relate to the global financial market of 2024. God has divided history between the time before the Messiah and the Son of God was born and the time afterwards. Even though there's a few years discrepancy, it's still interesting, it's all related, people accept it as being before Christ, before Messiah, and after Him. It doesn't matter when Muhammad was born, when Buddha was born, even when Moses was born, <clears throat> the world history is divided between before Jesus, before Yeshua, and after Him. This uh, time of year, I want to talk about the fourth kingdom and beast because things are happening in this war that are bringing to light the things that have been under the surface. Some people have been discerning and realizing what's being exposed, but a lot of darkness is coming into the light. A lot of things that have been uh, suppressed are coming out in full light for people to see and to make choices. God is sifting, I believe. He is separating that which is uh, of Him and that which is not of Him. Those who are for Him and those who are against Him. And this has to do also with being for His people, for His covenant purposes, and those who are either indifferent to them or simply against them. So the fourth beast and kingdom we read about in the dream of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, in chapter 2 of Daniel, he had a dream of a huge statue of different metals and some clay mixed with the final metal that was iron. Daniel the prophet was the only person who was given to understand. He got this from God, from God, you know, Jehovah his God, the God of Israel, when he sought an explanation to not only know the dream that Nebuchadnezzar was not telling anybody, but to interpret that dream for the king. And in Daniel chapter 7, we read that Daniel himself had a dream and visions of his head of four wild beasts representing four kings and kingdoms. Uh, there's no kingdom without a king. Uh, a king without a kingdom isn't a reigning king. So the four beasts represent four kings, which also then represent four kingdoms of those kings. And in both of these accounts of the dream of Nebuchadnezzar and the dreams and vision uh, of Daniel, they are the last kingdoms of the Gentiles. The fourth metal with its clay mixed in there and the fourth beast represent the last kingdom of the Gentiles, the last kingdom of this world, that Messiah then comes and totally destroys and scatters. This is a hope that we have. God is moving towards this, that the Messiah is going to return, praise the Lord, and He does have a set time that the Father has given. But all these kingdoms of the world that are in opposition to the kingdom of God and of Yeshua, of Jesus, being the king of that kingdom, he is going to put away finally and forever. And the kingdom that the Messiah will bring will be also shared, amazingly, with the saints, with the believers, whether we're Jewish or whether we're Gentile. We're going to be ruling and reigning with Him over Israel and the Gentile nations. 
And in both of these accounts, too, of Nebuchadnezzar's dream and of Daniel's dream and visions, the fourth kingdom is differentiated from the previous three kingdoms, the Babylonian kingdom, the Medes and Persian kingdom, and the Greek kingdom and empire. In Nebuchadnezzar's dream, the first three kingdoms are described by metals in declining value, decreasing value. Each one before was of more valuable as a metal, and each one decreased in value, but these decreasing kingdoms in value had more control over more territory than the preceding kingdoms. And the fourth kingdom was also differentiated because it had not only a metal, iron, but it was mixed with clay. In Daniel's dream and visions, the first three kings are described as fierce beasts, but the fourth beast and kingdom is specifically described as being dreadful and terrible and of being different than all the ones who had gone before it. Now you can find out more about what I'm speaking here if you look at the streams in the negative.com website. There's a whole written series there that I did in particular on Daniel, as well as on the letters to the churches in Revelation. And you can just do a search to find them. And also on our YouTube site, where we did some videos during the time of COVID on, these, on the book of Daniel. And uh, that link will be provided on this YouTube that we're doing right now. For this video, though, I want to just bring out a few points of what makes the fourth kingdom and beast different than all the others. <clears throat> First of all, we have to remember or take note of in chapter 12 of Daniel, the last chapter, he was told to seal and close the book <clears throat> until the time of the end, the end times. Not just the last days, but the time of the end of those last days. So all of the commentaries of the book of Daniel prior to the end times were being written based on a closed and sealed book, meaning they didn't have as much light as those who are writing about Daniel today. And I believe too many people today are, are relying still on commentaries that were written before the book was opened. <clears throat> and that's why we have some conflict of interpretation that God, again, is bringing to light more so that people can discuss them more and choose which one seems to fit the scriptures better than the others. I believe the end times of the last days began last century. We could say even maybe starting with the First World War uh, and maybe even the Zionist movement that was leading up to other things that would take place, especially after that First World War. But in particular, the end times, I believe, began with the reestablishment of the Jewish state of Israel and the Jewish people coming back here to live in the land that God promised as a possession, as an inheritance, an everlasting possession to the children of Jacob, of Isaac, and of Abraham. So now the end time prophecies that were written in Daniel are, are being opened up. The book is now opened and we can understand these prophecies better because the pieces are falling into place more than they would have been recognized for centuries uh, from the time that Daniel wrote the book and even after Yeshua came and until the end times began. So getting to some of these few points about what makes the fourth kingdom and beast different than the rest. The first three kingdoms had specific names, but not the fourth. The first three kingdoms were Babylon, the Medes and Persians, especially the Persian Empire, and the Greek Empire. The first three kingdoms did not utterly destroy the previous kingdoms before it. It didn't destroy the language and the culture. It actually allowed those to continue where, where they were relevant. But the fourth kingdom does crush everything about the kingdoms it conquered 
language, culture, sometimes uh, symbols, all manner of things to make it different than the previous kingdoms. The first three kingdoms were all geopolitical kingdoms within specific territories, but the fourth is not. Each of the metals in Nebuchadnezzar's dream, as I said, are of decreasing value, but those succeeding kingdoms all possessed more and greater territory. Each of the beasts in Daniel's vision are typically less strong than the beast that was before it. The first beast was a lion, the second a bear, the third a leopard. Typically, the lion is stronger than the bear, the bear is stronger than the leopard. But the fourth kingdom is spoken of as exceedingly dreadful. With an arrogant and blasphemous little horn, a vile person, as it's described, and this same little horn, this same vile person, is the New Testament Antichrist. In both Daniel and in the New Testament, this evil king and kingdom is given authority to make war against the saints and to prevail and to overcome. And the saints are Jewish believers of Israel and Gentile believers of the wider body of Messiah, the wider body of Christ. And this vile person, this Antichrist, is going to have authority from God to make war against the saints and to prevail against us physically. Physically. Rome, I think history uh, shows, Rome was not really so much different than the previous three kingdoms. Although Rome was the next succeeding kingdom after the Greek Empire, it wasn't so much different. The fact that you know, people say they use iron weapons. Well, the Philistines used iron weapons also. You can read about that in the Old Testament. But Rome is also usually known for, you know, not only well, for good roads, postal system, keeping order. Uh, they didn't conquer the territory of Babylon and the, most of the Persian Empire. And when they did conquer the Greek Empire, they allowed the, the religions to remain, the culture, the language, as long as it didn't upset the status quo. Even the Jewish people could practice, at least in the beginning, their Judaism, but at some point they were also expelled from Rome. So for me, I think it's clear this, in these days this war is bringing it out more clearly, and the book of Daniel is open, plus the book of Revelation was always open, just people didn't read it. Uh, Yeshua is telling us about the signs before his coming, before the end of the age, have been open for the last 2,000 years. But the book of Daniel, which Yeshua even refers believers to read to understand what's taking place in these last days, these end times of the last days, is open, and today we can see it more and more clearly. And this war is bringing to light what was, again, not spoken out loud as clearly, not presented as clearly, but Islam is declaring its war openly to destroy Israel and the Jewish people. And even if you look at some parts of the world, Christianity and Christians. This kingdom is different. It doesn't, it's coming out of the Middle East, which almost all of these kingdoms are about. Rome was Western but the territory they conquered was mostly, uh, not mostly, but mostly in the West and then also into the Middle East, but not entirely. The Middle Eastern countries are those that surround Israel. Today, they are all Islamic. Uh, Israel is a tiny little Jewish uh, country in a small land uh, that God has promised larger territory than what Israel presently uh, is sovereignly in control of. And Islam is a political and religious kingdom. It is not a territorial kingdom other than it has the intention to take over the entire world and bring it into submission to their God and to the prophet that began this religion with their God. Islam directly controls now one-fourth 
of the world's population and the territory. And indirectly, they are bringing into submission through terror and intimidation the rest of the world. We see it especially even in westernized, Christianized, gospelized countries, wherever they are, Europe, US, England, or the UK, in Australia, more and more coming into submissiveness to Islam and afraid to, sp to speak the truth about it. I remember growing up, learning again, I think I've said before, about the three great religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, all having the same God, which is clearly not the case. We learned in history all the bad things about Christianity, and some good things, but the bad things. We learned nothing, really, about anything negative from Islam just the contributions to uh, mathematics, uh, science, and art. And today, to speak anything uh, uh, that would be seen in a bad light regarding Islam, you're accused of being Islamophobic. But you can speak anything you want to against Jesus Christ, uh, the Son of God, uh, even though it can be blasphemous, that's, that's okay. That's all right. So no one today is afraid of Rome. No one's really expecting, <clears throat> except those who are fixed on what was written about centuries ago when the book of, Samuel, of Daniel, <laughs> when the book of Daniel was closed and sealed, <clears throat> looking for a revived Roman Empire. Today, I don't think really anybody believes we're going to see that. And certainly Rome is not a threat to the world. This is certainly not physically. Uh, Europe, even with the European Union, is not a threat physically to the rest of the world. Europe is under siege by Islamic immigration and, again, the fear of terrorism. Rome allowed for other religions, as I said, to be, to be expressed. Cultures, languages, it was okay as long as you didn't upset the status quo. Islam does not allow that in any country that it rules and any neighborhood it takes over if they're living in some other country. Islam began differently than the other three kingdoms before, including Rome, in direct opposition to God the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ, and to the Bible, the Old and the New Testaments, the word of the God who created the heavens and the earth, and who sent Jesus Christ, His Son, to be the Savior of all who will repent and believe in Him. Islam began after the revelation of Jesus Christ, after He came into the world, after He died and rose again from the dead. The other four kingdoms, including Rome, all began before he came. So those kingdoms were not set up consciously in opposition to the kingdom of God. Though spiritually, we understand that they all were opposed to the kingdom of God and to his purposes regarding Israel. That's why they didn't mind destroying J Jerusalem or attacking Israel. To them, it, rep it represented something, but it wasn't that they understood completely what Israel means to the sovereign God who has a purpose for the whole world to be blessed. So today's news is giving everybody to see, to hear, to make choices. Where is the danger? Where lies the kingdom that is trying to take over the world and is fierce and dreadful and so different than all the preceding kingdoms of the Gentiles, the preceding kingdoms of this world. Gog and Magog, if you read in Ezekiel chapters 38 and 39, all those countries allied with whoever Gog is and Magog, they're all basically Middle Eastern and Islamic. I believe the Vatican will be involved with that alliance, I believe Russia will be involved with that alliance. But I don't believe either one of those is the head of that alliance. And I think, again, the whole Middle Eastern context of the prophecies that we have point to someone that's going to be coming out from the Middle East.
Yeshua, if we, as we understand the fourth kingdom in Nebuchadnezzar's dream and the fourth beast in Daniel, both of those fourth kingdoms are the last ones leading to the return of the Lord, return of the Messiah. The Messiah turn, returns while that fourth kingdom and beast are in authority. The stone which is not cut out with hands that Nebuchadnezzar saw is the Messiah, who is the rock of Israel. He's going to come back and he's going to knock out completely all of that big statue, all of the kingdoms, those kingdoms of this world. That statue is still standing. When the fourth kingdom comes and with the uh, mixed clay and iron, the rest of the kingdom is still there. It's a statue standing from the head to the toes. The Lord's going to wipe out all of that, all of these Gentile kingdoms and all, that, all the kingdoms of this world opposed to him. Daniel saw the Son of Man in heaven returning, coming and taking over, uh, destroying the kingdoms of this world and that fourth vile person and fierce and dreadful beast. He is going to destroy that and the kingdom is going to be given to the saints. With the Messiah himself, the kingdom is going to be given to the saints to rule and to reign with him. And the judgments of the kingdoms of this world are going to be handed down and they will be found guilty. All of those who, who remained in opposition to the kingdom of God and to the king of God's kingdom. And his kingdom, praise God, too, is never going to pass away again. He gave it over he allowed it to be taken over by Satan to some extent when Adam uh, disobeyed him in the Garden of Eden and Satan was given authority. Even Satan understood that when he tempted Yeshua in the desert for, for after Jesus fasted and, and uh, was praying in the desert for 40 days and the devil came to tempt him. He said, okay, all kingdoms have been given to me. I will give it to you if you will worship me. And of course Yeshua said, get behind me, Satan. You should worship you shall worship only Jehovah your God. And he was also, I think, threatening Satan there as well, challenging him, because Yeshua knew he is also Jehovah, the God who created the one who became the devil. So the last days are going to be, as we have been warned about, by Yeshua, by Jesus, by Paul. The last days are going to be full of deception. And part of that deception is being distracted of seeing what's happening right in front of us. And for those who still hold strongly to Rome being uh, this fourth and final kingdom uh, and fourth and final beast, still looking to them to somehow reestablish themselves, are giving Islam more and more liberty to come in stealthily, but now again it's less stealthily, it's more and more openly to cause others to subject themselves, to be subjected to serving their purposes. It's a distraction, it is a deception. And deception is a tool of the enemy and he preys on ignorance, especially if you don't know, then anything we're told could be so, we don't know. If we know the truth, we are less likely to be deceived. But the deception also makes us fearful to speak the truth because we're not sure of the truth. Or that if we think we know the truth, but actually it is not true, the devil doesn't care. But if it is true, he's telling us, you keep quiet and you say nothing that's going to put him in jeopardy of being exposed. So I just want to bring this to you for your own consideration. Read Daniel, read Revelation, Read the whole Bible, the whole counsel of God, because that's really what this is partly about as well. And pray and ask the Lord to see if what I'm saying is in the truth, of the truth, in the right direction, or if not. But also, while we want to be sanctified more and more this year of 2024, become more like our Lord and our Savior, the Son of God, become more like him, who is the express image of the invisible God, the Father. We just want to see all of us 
follow our Good Shepherd wherever He may lead us, to follow the Lamb wherever He may lead us, so that we can be faithful to Him, trusting Him, knowing, I believe, as I've just as I've said in this video, the Antichrist, who is not that far off from being revealed, I don't believe, he is going to have authority to make war against us. We need to be prepared for that and not believe, I believe wrongly, that we won't be here for that. Personally, I can die today. I can die even while I'm speaking with you. But I believe from the Scriptures, the Lord is not going to come back while I'm speaking to you. I believe there are signs that we have been given that must take place before that will come. But we need to be prepared, should we be alive, when these things unfold and come to pass that are spoken of, the, the Lord Himself, God Himself, has given authority to the Antichrist for three and a half years to make war against the saints, to make war against Israel and the Jewish people, and to make war who keep the commandments of Jesus. So, God bless you this year. God bless all of us. There's war in Israel. There are wars in other parts of the world, Russia and Ukraine. There are more wars coming, rumors of wars coming, terrible things coming. A deceptive peace may also come, if I understand the scriptures correctly. But it is deceptive. It is not God's peace. And it's going to be a terrifying time in the spirit knowing this peace is deceptive and it is leading towards the worst time in the history of the world. So we want to prepare ourselves in our relationship with the Lord God Himself. We want to repent from lukewarmness. We want to repent from willful ignorance, even about God's plan and purposes for Israel. We want to repent of maybe loving the world too much in, the, in what the world is, not simply loving the people. We want them to be saved. And we do. We want to see enemies be saved. Uh, we're told to love our enemies, to, to pray for those who persecute us, bless those who curse us. We want to see more of these people be saved, be repent, to repent and believe the gospel, and to be given the gift of the Holy Spirit and the gift of eternal life through having their sins forgiven. Just as we have received freely, we want to see them and present to them the truth freely. But that we will be waking up. You know, the parable that Jesus gave of the ten virgins, all the virgins, all ten virgins were asleep. When the wake-up time was, came, when the, when the bells were ringing, only half of them understood the times and were prepared. The others were not prepared. They weren't really understanding and they weren't really actively dealing with it. So we want to be prepared. We want to be getting ourselves prepared and help others be prepared. So God bless you all. Thank you for listening, watching I hope having something to take seriously. Thank you, all, thank you who are praying for us here in Israel. May you also pray for your own nations. Uh, take the gospel to your own peoples, to the Jew, but also to the Gentiles. Because until the fullness of the Gentiles comes in, Israel as a nation is going to remain partially blinded. So may this year be a year that is good from God's point of view for those who love Him and those who are following Him, and hoping more and more to be keeping His commandments and to glorify His holy name. So shalom to you from Israel. Until next time.